Well, welcome again to another Friday night. We're continuing our series on reparenting, and we just finished a little bit on emotions, three weeks on emotions. And I thought one of the things that comes out of that, that is part of parenting, is teaching your child about vulnerability. So it's helping your child understand the importance of vulnerability, but also when to be vulnerable, when not to be vulnerable. So there's a lot of stuff that a child needs to learn to be healthy in this whole matter of vulnerability. And why I want to emphasize this is because for people from complex trauma, vulnerability is either a very scary word or a bad word. For most, vulnerability is something that was considered as weakness. It was something that if you were vulnerable, it ended up that you got hurt, you got rejected, people didn't want to connect with you anymore, you were laughed at, you were teased, you were looked down on and judged. Vulnerability was not a good thing. Vulnerability creates a lot of fear. And so we want to really explore looking at this because what, we, what I want you to see is vulnerability is essential to a healthy life. But something that is very scary for people from complex trauma. So just if you're looking for extra reading, Brene Brown has written a book called Daring Greatly. And it's just a wonderful book that really seeks to deal in depth with this topic of vulnerability. And I'm going to take it more in a complex trauma direction today, but her book is just an excellent read if you're looking for stuff. So let's begin with a definition. And it's really important, I think, in defining vulnerability that we also include a definition for weakness. And I want you to see that they're very different. Okay, So vulnerability, it comes from the word wound. And so it means to be capable of being wounded. It means to be open to attack or damage. Now that sounds like weakness, but it's not. Weakness is the inability to withstand attack or to prevent wounding. So vulnerability is to be in a place where you could be, but not necessarily end up wounded because you're strong enough. Weakness is very different. And so to put the two together and say they're the same is really misunderstanding them. So for most people, what we're working towards is that you have vulnerability, but then the strength that enables you to not put yourself in situations where you're going to be wounded. So we're going to get into that. Another way to understand vulnerability, it is emotional exposure which involves uncertainty and risk. So I'm going to reveal some stuff about myself, but that, uh, that makes it a little bit uncertain and risky. Because by expressing these parts of myself, I'm opening myself up to being wounded by you, to your judgment, to your responses, to my opening up these parts of myself. So vulnerability is a person who is able to be authentic. So their vulnerability is, I am going to become be authentic, but that's making me vulnerable because people are going to see the real me. Another way to say that is, I'm going to be fully human. I'm going to be fully myself. And so as soon as I do that, I make myself vulnerable because now others might judge me. Others might talk about me. Others might put me down. Others might hurt me. So vulnerability, when it's done in a safe place, is being able to express all of myself, talk, all of, talk about all parts of myself, knowing that I could be attacked, but I won't. So I can let that stuff be seen. So we struggle with that in general, but we struggle with it the most when it comes to parts that we know are very sensitive, very 
uh, are easy to hurt, parts that are tender, parts that are soft, parts that others might see as weak. So do I express tears? Do I express fear? Do I express sadness? Those that's kind of my soft underbelly. Do I expose that to people and let them see that? Because they could judge that or they could hurt me. Or do I talk about my struggles where I'm feeling weak? That, that makes me vulnerable. And so those are the components of vulnerability that we struggle the most with, the parts that are most easily wounded. So vulnerability is the ability to be open and authentic. Let me give you some examples, just maybe help this sink in. <clears throat> You're going to share an unpopular opinion. Immediately you feel, that makes me vulnerable. Or you're going to say no to somebody and stand up for yourself. Immediately you feel vulnerable. Or you're going to ask somebody for help. That could make you feel vulnerable. Or you're going to share with somebody that you're really, really struggling with a temptation or relapsing to an addiction. Just sharing that level of struggle makes you vulnerable. Or you're you're going to admit to somebody that you were wrong or that you're afraid. That makes you vulnerable. Or you're going to ask somebody that you've hurt for forgiveness and you're not sure they're going to forgive you. Or you've just failed at something and now you're going to go try again. That makes you vulnerable. Or you've been dreaming about starting a program or a business for years and now you're going to do it. Whoa, you feel vulnerable. Or you go, you know what, I'm tired of wearing masks. I'm now going to be real authentic. So today I'm going to refuse to suck it up and act like everything's great and put on all my masks. I'm going to be real. That makes you feel vulnerable. Let me give you some words that people use to describe what vulnerability feels like. So vulnerability feels like being naked in public. So what you're seeing is that vulnerability is an emotion, but it has all these other not-so-good-feeling emotions connected to them. So somebody said... Vulnerability is lots of nervousness, lots of anxiety, uncertainty, insecurity, unknown, fear, self-consciousness, all balled up into an emotion. That's vulnerability. Or it's like walking on a tightrope or going out on a limb. All the fear and insecurity that's part of that. Taking the first step towards something you fear the most. So I'm going to do this. You take the first step. That, those emotions are what it feels like. Bearing your belly in the face of an enemy or letting go of control. All of those are the emotions connected to this vulnerability thing. So you can see why it is such a troublesome thing. It is such a, th a thing that's been a source of great damage for many people from complex trauma that now they're afraid of because it's got a lot of painful emotions involved. But it's not just negative emotions. People go on to say vulnerability, it feels like taking off a straight jacket for the first time. It feels like getting out of prison for the first time. It feels like freedom. Others say this, yes, vulnerability, there's panic, anxiety, fear, hysteria, but it's followed by freedom, pride, amazement, and then a little bit of anxiety and panic comes back. So it leads to wonderful emotions. You got to get through some painful ones first. So that's important to understand. But let's just really come back to why is vulnerability important? 
Because a lot of people from complex trauma basically go, I'm done with vulnerability. Not going there again. Been hurt too many times by being authentic, by allowing myself to be vulnerable. Why should we relearn this? Why should we reparent ourselves to know when it's appropriate to be vulnerable and to become vulnerable? The bottom line is that basically everything healthy is connected to being vulnerable. That is just essential to understand. The research is showing that people who are able to be vulnerable in healthy relationships that are safe, those are the people with the best mental health and the best physical health. So being able to be vulnerable has a profound effect on our health. Next is vulnerability is the only thing that leads to true connection with others, and true connection with others is what leads to feelings of well-being and joy and contentment. So vulnerability is necessary for connection. And once that connection takes place, vulnerability leads to deeper trust. It leads to deeper respect. It leads to a deeper understanding in relationship. In other words, vulnerability is absolutely essential to having the healthy, intimate relationship we desire. You can't have a healthy, intimate relationship without vulnerability. It's impossible. So, key to understand with that, though, is you can't have healthy, intimate relationship without vulnerability with safe people. So important to understand. Somebody has said this, lack of vulnerability will enable you to survive, and that's what you might have to do in certain relationships is not be vulnerable, so you just survive, but vulnerability is what enables you to thrive. Every good thing that is truly worthwhile that we want from life, deep connection, joy, peace, contentment, trust, all of those things come out of vulnerability. It is the necessary ingredient to get all of the things we want most in life. Now, think about it this way. Most of us have an internal contradiction. I find it fascinating in watching people from complex trauma is that many of them are attracted to somebody who shows vulnerability. They love that. They're immediately attracted to it. They see that as such strength. And they're drawn to it. But... While they're drawn to the vulnerability of others, they hate their own vulnerability and never want to go there. They see their own vulnerability as weakness, as exposing how inadequate they are. Whereas they see it in others as strength, they see it as themselves as weakness. As they're drawn to others' vulnerability, they have an aversion to their own vulnerability. And so it's important to realize, okay, why then am I drawn to vulnerability? Because something in me knows it's beautiful. Something in me knows it's strength. Something in me knows that it's an important thing. And what they also realize is that when they're drawn to vulnerability, there's something in them that's realizing, I connect with people who are vulnerable. I want to connect. And there's an attraction because of that. So we love to see courage in others who are vulnerable and go, wow, the courage they have to be vulnerable. But we just shy away from it in ourselves. So look at that in, your, in yourself. Now let me take this in another direction for you. I don't know if you've thought about children naturally coming into the world and vulnerability. See, children are naturally authentic and naturally vulnerable. 
They just put themselves out there. They just show their belly. They show their soft parts. They just put all their emotions out there. They are naturally vulnerable. Now what's key to understand is children are also weak. They can't protect themselves, but children trust that the people, their caregivers, are going to protect them, that their caregivers fully accept them for who they are, that their caregivers have unconditional love for them. That's why they can be authentic and vulnerable because they trust they will be protected and accepted in being that. What they also have an instinct for is this. Being authentic and vulnerable, it's so we can connect so you can see the real me, so I can see the real you. And so vulnerability and authenticity lead to connection. That is built into them. Now let's bring in complex trauma. A child is authentic and vulnerable. The people, their caregivers, don't protect them, don't accept them, don't give unconditional love. They get hurt, 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 hurt. All of a sudden, being authentic and vulnerable is no longer something that is good, it is now something that is bad. Being authentic and vulnerable does not lead to connection. It leads to severing relationships. People don't want to connect with you. It shuts stuff down. And so it is now seen as weakness. It is now seen as something that is bad that's going to get you hurt. And that to me is a tragedy. So let me get more specific about that. What is it that caused some children to stop being vulnerable in specifics? So they show their soft underbelly, they get laughed at or teased. Or they cry or show some fear and they get punished. They get told they're weak. They get told that that's a bad emotion, that they're bad for having that emotion. Or they grow up and they have no role models who show vulnerability. Everybody's superficial. Everybody's surface. Everybody's hard. Nobody talks about those deeper, softer emotions. And so they just don't get that. So they end up with the conclusion that vulnerability is bad. So key in understanding complex trauma is this. The result of complex trauma is the conclusion of everybody with complex trauma that vulnerability is a bad thing. Something to be avoided. Something that's only going to lead to hurt. And so the reparenting process is a massive relearning of when it's okay to be vulnerable. The value of being vulnerable. What that looks like for you. How to do it well. Now, I've got to take it one step further. The child, they conclude that vulnerability, which they thought was going to lead to connection, they thought that vulnerability actually led to people not wanting to connect with them. But that, take it further, then led them to the reason people don't want to connect with me is not just that I'm vulnerable, it's that I'm not good enough. I was authentic. I let them see the real me, and it's not good enough. So vulnerability led to feeding shame. And so in complex trauma, vulnerability leads to pain, leads to shame. And that becomes a key way of understanding what happens in complex trauma regarding vulnerability and how it ends up at shame. And it's just a massive, massive tragedy that comes out of complex trauma. So there's basically three myths that come out of complex trauma regarding vulnerability. So number one we've referred to is that vulnerability is weakness. That only weak people show that stuff. Strong people don't need to show tears. They don't show fear. They are Nothing but strong strength, strong emotions. Let me just say this as a reminder. 
I am not vulnerable around unsafe people, around toxic people, because why expose myself to people who don't respect it, who are going to abuse that? So vulnerability is dangerous around people who haven't dealt with their complex trauma issues. Be aware of that. But understand this, vulnerability is the core of all emotions. To feel emotions at all, to express emotions at all, is to put myself out there. It's to be vulnerable. And so even people that are only expressing certain emotions, there's still an amount of vulnerability that they're allowing. So that to say vulnerability is bad is to say that emotions are bad because that's ultimately what we're expressing and putting out there. It is important to understand that often the people that say, I'm strong, I'm not vulnerable, are actually displaying weakness. It takes strength and courage to say, I'm going to let you see all of me. I am going to show you my soft underbelly. That requires a strength that many of them don't have because they're controlled by fear, not by strength. The second myth is, I don't do vulnerability. I've been hurt too many times, I'm not going there again. Now some, this comes out of complex trauma in this way. It's easy for a child to realize, okay, I am weak, I'm dependent on others, and so being vulnerable, I get hurt, I get hurt, I get hurt, that's because I'm a child. Once I get to be an adult, then I won't need to be vulnerable again because I won't have weak emotions anymore. And so it's easy to get the belief in their mind that the mark of maturity, the mark of success in life, is all of the negative weak emotions are gone. And you only experience strong emotions. You only experience strength. Understand this. Being grown up and healthy is not about the lack of vulnerability. It's about accepting that I'm human, which means I'm vulnerable. And it's being wise about when to be vulnerable. So vulnerability does not disappear as you get healthier and healthier. You're always going to have vulnerability, but you're going to become wise about it, and you're going to accept it. Let me take that further. If you say, I'm not going to do vulnerability anymore, basically what you're saying to me is two things. Number one, I am going to live a life without connection. And I'm not sure that's where you want to go. Basically, I'm going to feel lonely all the time, even if I'm in relationships. Basically, I'm never going to have that true, healthy intimacy and connection my heart longs for. Second thing is this. When you avoid vulnerability and have to be strong all the time, you're still going to be feeling these emotions. What are you going to do with them? That's when you then have to engage in behaviors to deal with those emotions so you don't show them, so that you appear strong. And what you will find is most of those behaviors that you engage in are behaviors that ultimately hurt you and hurt relationships. So the very things that you have to do to prevent being vulnerable end up being self-destructive and destructive to relationships. So you can choose to say I'm never going to be vulnerable again, but what you are doing is consigning yourself to a very painful, miserable, lonely life. That's the bottom line. Now there's a third misunderstanding, I would say, that has developed around vulnerability. Some people think that vulnerability is basically letting it all hang out with everybody I meet. Another way to say that is that vulnerability is indiscriminate disclosure. I share all my feelings, all my experiences 
with everybody whether or not they've earned the right to hear them. Let me just talk about this for a minute. Too much information, TMI, is not too much vulnerability. It is using vulnerability to try and meet unmet needs in the wrong way. So make that distinction. Too much information, indiscriminate disclosure is not healthy vulnerability. It is actually for some people a way of avoiding healthy vulnerability and trusting relationships. For others, it's trying to get needs met in unhealthy ways. So that is important to understand. So somebody said this, that leading with our darkest secret is not vulnerability. It may be woundedness. It might be desperation. It might be acting on bad advice. It might be attention seeking, but it's not healthy vulnerability. True vulnerability respects the other person and shares only what they can bear. So if I'm truly vulnerable, that will look different with a child than it will with my wife. That will look different with a person I meet for the first time. It depends on the relationship. It depends on the other person. It depends on what they can bear. And so healthy vulnerability is based on mutuality. You both agree that this is where the relationship should go. And that means then that healthy vulnerability requires boundaries and trust in the relationship. It requires boundaries that say these topics we can talk about, these ones we're not ready for. That is healthy vulnerability. So let me take that a little bit further. Healthy vulnerability leads to deeper connection, deeper understanding, and deeper trust. Unhealthy vulnerability or vulnerability without boundaries actually leads to disconnection. People go, oh, don't want to be around you. It leads to disengagement, distrust. It has the opposite effect of what healthy vulnerability has. So that's so important to be able to understand that. So let me go into this reparenting today where you think about, okay, I need to be vulnerable to, as part of my getting healthy. That usually will bring up fear. So what are the fears that come up as soon as you think of being vulnerable? Well, usually fear of being rejected once they see my soft underbelly, or fear of abandonment, Fear that nobody will want to connect with me. All of that is shame. So again, you come back to when vulnerability was not protected in the child, it leads to shame. That is the issue now. And so the fear is if I'm vulnerable, people are going to see what I'm really like and reject me. They're going to see how rejectable I am. And so vulnerability is I'm coming out of hiding. Shame's biggest priority is I have to remain hidden. And so what you are doing in choosing to be vulnerable is going opposite of what shame is pulling you to do. You're fighting shame. And that is such an important healing thing to do if you're realizing you need to deal with shame is vulnerability becomes a way to break the back of shame at times, but understand that you're fighting shame. That is what behind it. And so the greater your shame, the more difficult it is to be vulnerable. So expect this. <laughs> kind of two things that will happen. So let's say you say, okay, I'm going to choose to be Vulnerable, I'm going to open up in group today and or with my counselor and tell them something 
I've never told anybody before, get ready for fear. You are going to feel fear, anxiety, panic, want to run, all kinds of insecurities. That's just going to get all bottled up inside of you as you think about sh being vulnerable. Fear that you're going to be rejected once they find out that you're going to be judged, you're going to get hurt again. But walk through that fear. And as you walk through that fear, what you're going to find is that the people are safe, then it's going to be a good experience. It's going to lead to positive emotions. So that becomes the first thing. But you've got to walk through fear. And I would say start in increments. Just share a little bit. See if it's safe. If it is safe, share a bit more. So it's gradual opening up as part of this vulnerability journey. But then expect the second thing, which is a vulnerability hangover. So you go through the fear then you feel great, and then you, uh-oh, did I share too much? Uh-oh, this is overwhelming, and you just feel like you want to run away. I made a big mistake. All of those things can come afterwards. Be prepared for that and go, this is just part of what happens when you choose to be vulnerable again. Now, some people over the years have developed ways of never being vulnerable. Ways that they're not even aware are there. They just are systems that kick in subconsciously whenever they approach anything that resembles vulnerability. So the first one I have to explain, it's a little tricky to understand, but it's basically whenever they have a good feeling that good feeling makes them feel vulnerable. And it's like, uh-oh, something good's happening instead of all the bad that's been going on in my life, instead of all this terrible stuff. Uh-oh, what, what's going on here? And what comes with that is what Brene Brown calls foreboding joy. In other words, uh-oh, the other shoe's about to drop. Something bad is about to happen. So their brain runs to predict something bad is about to happen. And so, in order to not give, give in and just enjoy this new pleasant stuff and the vulnerability that they feel by enjoying all this good stuff, their brain goes into panic. Oh, I can't let myself be vulnerable with all this good stuff. This is too dangerous. So they go to, let's sabotage. Let's just make bad stuff happen. Or they go to, whenever they're in good stuff, let's find something wrong with it. Let's look for negative. That will enable me to go back to being negative. And so they have a default setting of negative, of gloom, of disappointment, that whenever they're not in that default setting, it makes them feel vulnerable. And, and, and they start to panic, but instead of allowing themselves to be there, they got to sabotage it and go back to their default setting. The second armor that many people have to try to never feel vulnerable is to be perfect. Perfectionism. So perfectionism, we do a whole talk on it, but it's a self-destructive belief system, which basically is that if I look perfect and do everything perfectly, I can avoid or minimize any painful feelings of shame that I'm not good enough, any judgment, any blame. In other words, if I'm perfect, I would never be vulnerable. And so the focus of their being perfect is not their internal world. It's let's create an external world that is perfect then people will respect me. Then people will love me. Then people will want to connect with me. Then people will adore me. So the solution to all the shame that they feel is create an external world that perfect. Then that will get me all the adoration that I am good enough. And so then I never feel vulnerable. And so that's where some people go. 
Another one that some people have is as soon as they start to feel vulnerability, and this usually is happening subconsciously, they get antsy. They don't like these feelings. They don't know what to do with these feelings. They don't have tools for these feelings, and they sure can't sit in them for very long, so they need to numb these feelings. So any feeling that causes them to feel vulnerable, they need to numb. And so they do that through, let's constantly be entertained, let's be crazy busy all the time, never slow down, go 100 miles an hour, that way we never have to feel or let's just live out of our head and be highly cerebral and analytical, or for some, they just numb with an addiction. Let's medicate our feelings through food, through sex, through drugs, through alcohol. That way I don't have to feel. And so for some, that's their way to defend against vulnerability. And then the fourth one is people that are just in denial that they are vulnerable. And so if they ever feel any vulnerable emotions, oh, I don't feel that. I'm just positive all the time. I'm just happy all the time. And they never allow themselves to think or be honest about the full extent of their emotional world because they're afraid of it. So they just convince themselves that they're only this one emotion all the time. And so for some, it's always positive. Others, it's always funny, always upbeat. That's their way of avoiding vulnerability. So be aware of that in yourself. Okay, so let's go into making this very practical. You say, I want to start moving towards greater vulnerability with safe people as part of my reparenting recovery process. Number one, you have to develop self-compassion, which is, I think, helped by the fact that realizing every human is vulnerable. So being vulnerable isn't you being an oddball where everybody else is strong and never feels anything vulnerable. No, everybody feels vulnerable. You're just now being part of the group. And so don't be down on yourself that you feel vulnerable emotions. Have compassion to yourself and realize, oh, okay, I'm just acknowledging what everybody experiences in my life. Secondly, find safe people. So essential. Thirdly, when those vulnerable feelings start to come up, let yourself feel them. Don't run away from them. Don't try to bring out your armor to defend against it. Let yourself feel. Take that further. Become mindful. Stop intentionally throughout the day to go, what am I feeling? To get in touch with those more underbelly type emotions, softer emotions. Take that further. Become vulnerable with yourself. So sit down and go, wow, I am really feeling a lot of anxiety. Write about that. Explore that in yourself. Journal about it. All of that becomes allowing yourself to expose yourself to yourself, which is so important. But the key piece to me in being vulnerable is heal your shame. The fear is, In being vulnerable, I'm coming out of hiding, not of this wonderful person, but what I'm bringing out of hiding is this less than, not good enough person that everybody's going to judge. And what I have to realize is, whoa, that's a whole bunch of lies that I received. So I need to heal that shame and realize what I'm bringing out into the open is a wonderful person. Yes, a person that's got wounds, a person that's got flaws, but it's a person that is basically good. It's a person that is human like everybody else. It's not less than. As that heals, that enables you to move along this road of vulnerability. The next is very important. 
Vulnerability brings up feelings that are uncomfortable that up till now you have always run away from. Now you have to learn to sit in them. That they're not bad, they're not going to kill you, they don't feel good, but you can learn tools to manage them. You can learn tools to just sit in it and go, yeah, that'll pass, that's okay. It's not the end of the world. And so part of learning to deal with vulnerability is learning to sit in uncomfortable emotions instead of engaging in the flight response. Develop curiosity about your emotions. So as you feel this emotion, identify it, but go, I wonder why it's there. I wonder what's triggered it. I wonder what's happening. So begin to explore and understand those emotions and get to know them. For some people, they've been so cut off from their emotions and vulnerability for so long, they just don't know how to start. And sometimes what you need is a good therapist that can help you begin to become vulnerable and connect to your emotions. Once you do it, what I encourage people to do is have one safe person in your life that you commit to connect with every week and share vulnerability, share vulnerably. So that once a week you say, this is our planned time for me to open up. And that gets you in the habit of it. If you just wait to be vulnerable when you feel like it, it might not happen. So sometimes you initially have to plan for it. So vulnerability, scary as anything, but so important if you want to get healthy. I hope that gives you a few tools to just understand it a bit better and to get you on this journey of growing in this area. Well, that's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break, and I'm going to come back for the second part, which is Christian spiritual part. If that doesn't interest you, no problem. We're not offended. You're free to go. We'll see you next week. For everybody else, we'll be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. I want to do another talk on spiritual bypassing, especially we've been talking about emotions and vulnerability, because I think for many people, what they don't realize is they often look to spirituality as a way to bypass anything that makes them feel vulnerable emotionally, especially sitting in times of the unknown, which is what for many people, is feeling vulnerable emotionally. So when you're in times of the unknown, is you can't know what's happening circumstantially, you can't know all the events that are going to take place, but for a child, that's not a problem because you just trust people who do know. So trust overcomes that fear of the unknown. But what happens with complex trauma is you come out of not being able to trust because people have always let you down. So now you face times of unknown and you can't trust anybody, can't trust a higher power. And so times of unknown, they are scary. And they make you feel very vulnerable that you're going to get hurt. So what happens for most people when they're facing a time of the unknown which makes them feel vulnerable, is their first idea is I need more information. Then it will become less unknown. Now that can be healthy, but it can also be unhealthy. And so part of the healthy is I need to talk to somebody who's been on this journey, who understands it, who can help me know what to expect, who can give me tools to navigate it, and can help me know kind of what's going to happen in all of this world so that it becomes less unknown. No, it doesn't take away all of the unknown, but it sure helps. That can be very healthy. What can happen that's unhealthy for some people from complex trauma is I want to know every detail of what's going to happen. I want to know every possible scenario, every possible outcome, so that I 
have everything in black and white. I don't have to guess. All of the unknown is gone. Everything becomes known. And those people can hound you with questions. They can just hound you wanting detail after detail and drive you crazy. But that is their way of trying to deal with the unknown. So instead of choosing to trust you, their only solution is get all the information so there is no longer an unknown. That way you don't have to sit in it, and that way you don't have to trust. Now some go even further. And this is where it can go to what I call spiritual bypassing. And what they look for is there a spiritual source that will give me the information to make this unknown go away. And so over different cultures and religions, you get different spiritual bypassing that comes into play when people are in times of sitting in the unknown, and they don't want to sit in it, and they don't want to trust God. So what do they do? Well, let's go to a psychic. Let's go to a prophet. They will tell us what is happening. Let's go to a medium, and we'll get extra information from the outside world. Or some even go, let's just close our eyes and flip our Bible open and stick our finger down, and that's God telling me what to do. So they're trying to force God to give them black and white information so the unknown is gone. Now I hope you can see that this can be very dangerous, but instead of getting hung up on all the different things that people might do, what I want you to understand is what's really going on. They are trying to bypass two things. They are trying to bypass sitting in the unknown, which is uncomfortable, but they're also trying to bypass trusting God. That God is watching out for me, I can trust him. So instead of doing things that are helping them in their spiritual life, they are actually doing things that are hurting them. Because they're not growing in trust, and they're not growing in sitting in the unknown, trusting God. So let me bring in a part of the Bible that sadly Christians have often used only in one way. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 to 13, God warns people about going to psychics and all of that, but the point is this. God is saying, I am going to take you on a journey and that's going to require you going through the unknown. What I want you to do at those times is trust me that I am taking care of you. But some of you are not going to want to do that. And so you're going to go looking for extra information in whatever way you can get it from a medium, from a psychic, whatever. What I want you to realize is that many Christians today are doing the same thing. They're violating what God is warning about in Deuteronomy 18, only they're doing it through Christian sanctified ways of getting extra information. Let's get somebody with a prophetic gift that's going to tell us what to do. Let's, and they have their own ways of trying to not trust God in the unknown, but get extra information. They're doing the exact same thing that they're condemning in others. What I want you to realize is what God shows right from the very beginning of Genesis, right on through Exodus as he works with the people of Israel coming out of slavery, is that the foundation of a healthy life and a healthy relationship is being able to trust. And part of what being able to trust must include is trusting God. Now, none of us does that perfectly. It's always an ongoing, growing process. But what God is saying is, I want to help you grow in trust. I want to help you grow to know me, that I am trustworthy. So I'm going to take you on a journey 
And a necessary part of that journey, if you're going to grow in trust and to get to know me, is I've got to take you through the unknown. And many of you are not going to like that. And many of you are going to try to run from that and get extra information. But I want you to not do that. And so the reason I'm taking you in the unknown is not because I want to be mean. It's because I want you to grow. And I want our relationship to grow. And I want it to become deeper and more meaningful. So beware of spiritual bypassing that bypass that seeks to bypass sitting in the unknown and trusting God in the unknown. You may never have thought about that you've done that, but if you become aware of it, I hope it will help you to realize, wow, I'm avoiding trust, and that is not a healthy thing. Let's pray. God, again, thank you that you've given us warnings that sometimes we miss what you're saying, but once we begin to realize that you're warning us to avoid ways of bypassing, trusting you in times of sitting in the unknown. And I just pray that you would help each person wherever they're at. Amen. Well, that's the end of another Friday night. Thank you.